How's that sound, Stephen? All I right, sounds too. sounds good. Yeah, my contact information will be at the end of the, the presentation, but I'm sure you'll have it on your website as well, certainly. So do I uh, start now? Go for it, Stephen. All right, well, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Stephen Van Tassel. I own a company called Wildlife Control Consultant. So the goal of this particular presentation is two things. I have two goals for you to take away. The first goal is to protect yourself. So I'm going to talk about some issues that you're confronting that you may not know you're confronting. And I want you to be safe because we want you to be around to inspect future homes in uh, future homes and as well as to stay around for your family and have a wonderful retirement from with your career. So we want you to be happy, healthy, and hopefully wealthy as well. Then that's, that's, that's step number one. Step number two is I want to give you some tips to help you identify some things that you might see when you're doing an inspection. So you're like, oh, I know what that is, or give you some, some tools to help you narrow some things down so that you can be a little more informed, so you can identify particular threats uh, to people. So this particular presentation was based off of a presentation I gave to the American Society of Home Inspectors back, oh, when I was at the University of Nebraska. So we've uh, made some modifications to it, and so you're gonna be seeing uh, some, some advances from, from that. So why don't we get, why don't we get started? So the first thing, of course, is customers don't like surprises. So here we have an example of, uh, you know, certainly a mouse, and then we have some droppings here in this filing cabinet. So we have an infestation. If you look over here to the right, there are the droppings. I did a close-up shot. That just gives me a moment here. When you're taking photographs, learn how to use your camera. And so it is important. I'm, I'm assuming many of you already know how to do that, but when you're taking diagnostic or forensic type photos, it's imperative to make sure you get crisp shots at full resolution. So really learning how to hold that camera still because even tapping the, if you're tapping a camera, for instance, to, to take the take the shot. Sometimes that little micro vibration can do a lot. So really learn how to use your camera and also something for scale because if you get close enough, even a mouse dropping can look like a bear dropped it. So we want to be sure you're using the right thing. The second thing is recognize that sometimes your surprises are visible. You can see them readily, like the bats hanging on the exterior of this particular vent. Now this is a vent that has mosquito netting and so the vent, the bats came in under the vent and they're just hanging up on that mosquito netting because it hasn't eaten through yet. And so they're not in the attic. They're just simply hanging on that vent. But over time, the urine and guano is going to break through that particular uh, screening and they're going to be able to get access into that particular building. This is why we always tell people screen your vents from the outside, never from the inside. They're always to be screened from the outside. But some threats, of course, are harder to see. And that's when we're starting to get down in the insect area. Fleas can transmit various diseases. Murine typhus would be certainly one of them. And they're certainly going to be annoying to clients uh, when they have them. So Fleas are associated with certain wildlife species, particularly in the south. You have possums under someone's deck or something. They'll often carry fleas. Those fleas can then be uh, moved into the house, particularly if they have pets as well. So those can be long-term problems. But it can also be an issue when you're crawling through into that crawl space. Are you you know, you may be getting the creepy crawlies after you finish uh, going through a crawl space. And that may not all be in your head. It may actually be that you do have some creepy crawlies on you that you need to be aware of. And then, of course, some issues are extremely hard to see. And I'm talking here about histoplasma capsulatum. This is the fungus that causes the infection, histoplasmosis. Those of you living uh, in the Ohio River Valley are particularly vulnerable to this. Fungus likes warm, moist environments. But if you're in areas where there's large quantities of bird droppings, uh, that are in uh, organic soil, like uh, bird droppings below a tree, for instance, or you're in an area where you have bats in an attic over an extended period of time and you stir up that debris and you breathe it in without proper protection, you could be exposing yourself to histoplasmosis uh, infection. And that will give you, often exhibit itself as a dry cough, but we'll talk more about that particularly later. So as I said before, we have some risks that you're going to face those risks are both with disease,
but you also have risks of physical danger when we're dealing with wildlife as well. And then we have the client side of issues, and that is how wildlife can impact negatively the uh, certainly the looks of a structure, but also the physical integrity of that particular structure. And so we'll be highlighting some of those things for you as well. So let's talk about your health. I want you to be I want you to be healthy, and I want you to protect yourself. So we'll give you a new term for many of you, I'm sure, is zoonotics. What does zoonotics mean? Well, it means diseases transmitted from wildlife or animals that can be transmitted to people. And so here's an interesting statistic for you, that is 60% of all infectious diseases are zoonotic in origin. So while a lot of people like to quote unquote get back to nature, a lot of people forget that nature can kill you. And so if we're not careful in how we're getting back to nature, we're actually exposing yourself. And you can see a classic example of that when people try to drink raw milk, for instance. Raw milk, you have to get raw milk. Well, there are diseases associated with raw milk. And every now and again, I just saw one recently where there was a little outbreak of a disease associated with raw milk. So getting back to nature, there's reasons why we do certain things today because and sometimes we forget why we do them until we have an incident. So I want you to be aware that when you're crawling around these attics and you're crawling around these crawl spaces, you are potentially exposing yourself to certain zoonotic diseases and I want you to prepare yourself. I'm not trying to scare you. I just want you to be aware so that you can make some simple steps to protect yourself and really reduce the risk of you getting uh, any of these infections. So let's talk about some definitions here. This, this is the disease matrix, how uh, disease is transmitted from in zoonotic environments. So we have what's called the agent, that is the infectious organism. That's called the agent. Then we have something called the reservoir, and that is the organism that maintains the agent in the environment. But interestingly, the, the reservoir is, doesn't get negatively affected by the disease. It's simply a carrier. Then you have what's called the vector, which is the taxi driver. I call it the taxi where it brings the agent to the host. And we're gonna treat ourselves as the host. The host is the organism namely us, could be a pet as well, negatively impacted by the disease. So again, the reservoir isn't negatively impacted by the disease. The reservoir carries a disease and it's living its life like, like normally. However, the host is negatively affected. So when we understand how disease is transmitted, if we can break that chain, then we don't get the disease. And that's why it's important for you to understand these concepts. So here's an example of rabies. A lot of people are certainly aware of rabies. Rabies is a zoonotic disease. It's carried in wildlife, mammals particularly, and it can be transmitted to us typically through a bite. So we have the, the agent, that is the rabies virus here in the left. It's called a rhabdovirus because it looks like a bullet and it's carried by bats, not all bats, it's a very small percentage of bats, but bats are one of the carriers. And so that would be the vector. And so when the bat bites us, we can contract rabies because we're the host and we would die. It, will the bat die as well? Absolutely, the bat will die, but it can take a while for that bat to die. What's the reservoir for rabies? Well, we're not really sure. We don't really know what the reservoir is. It seems that the virus is slow enough in bats because maybe bats would be treated as the reservoir, but bats are negatively impacted. So they are not really a reservoir, they're a vector and a host because they get killed by it, but we don't really know what the reservoir is for rabies. But the point is, is that if we can prevent the bite from the bat, we're not gonna get rabies from the bat. And that's what you need to understand. And so we'll talk more about that uh, later, later on. Are there other vectors for rabies? Absolutely. Raccoons, skunks, bats, I've already mentioned, foxes, skunks, but there's even more than that. But here's the thing, only mammals can carry rabies. It has to be a mammal. It's not gonna be a bird. It's not gonna be a snake. It's not, it's not gonna be a frog. It has to be a mammal, a warm-blooded creature. Any mammal can carry, can carry rabies, but these are among the most common organisms that would be able to transmit rabies. So here's the rule. People think that these animals are out hunting humans down trying to bite them. That is simply not true. 80% of all rabies exposures are human initiated. 
Now, what that means in English, it means that the human went to the animal, not the animal to the human. Often this occurs with kids going over to quote unquote, help the raccoon. And so therefore they get bit. They get too close and the animal lashes out and all of a sudden there's an exposure. So 80%, so here's the bottom line. If you see animals, leave them alone. Even when you see them in an attic, leave them alone. Back off, go away, and you'll find yourself. Animals are typically not chasing humans down. So we don't want to create some fear mongering here. Rabies exhibits itself in two different forms called the furious. This is the one that gets in the newspapers. That's where the animal starts acting crazy and it can chase you, although this is re relatively rare. But then there's also the dumb and paralytic phase where the animal becomes very passive. This is where most people get exposed to rabies because they're trying to help the animal. Well, maybe you got hit by a car. Maybe I want to go over and maybe it's injured or something and then they get too close. They don't know what they're doing and they get, they get bit at that particular point. So rabies can exhibit itself in two different ways. But the biggest challenge, of course, is people with bats. This is why we, wanna, we don't want bats in people's houses because when bats are in people's houses, their potential for that bat to come down into the living space and have an exposure. The problem with bat bites is that a person can be bitten while they're sleeping and not know it. Notice what I have here in this picture. It's a little pixelated, but I want you to see, or not what you don't see here is you don't see definitive bite marks. Now we've had to circle the spot where the bite bat bit. Now if you're awake and you get bit by a bat, you're going to know it. But if you're asleep, you can be bit by a bat and wake up and you may think, well, won't I see the bite marks? And the answer is probably not because you're looking at pinpricks and that will be enough to expose you to rabies. And so whenever someone has a bat in their living space, that bat needs to be captured and then discuss the discuss the situation with a health official to see if that bat needs to be tested for rabies and whether there are any rabies shots that need to be transmitted. So don't hit it with a tennis racket because we need to have an intact brain with the bat. So I know that that's something that most of you are never going to encounter in your work with home inspecting. But I want you to appreciate how important it is that if you see signs of bats, and we'll, we'll get to that, we'll show you what those signs are going to be, if you see it, why it's important to make that known to your client. And even if you end up having bats in your own house and you have a bat flying around your living space, make sure that bat gets captured and you contact health officials because people can be bitten and not know it. I had a colleague of mine out of Colorado. He was doing some bat work and he knew exactly where he was bitten. He was awake at the time. He was doing bat work. 45 minutes later, he drove, you know, he was at the hospital. He knew exactly where he was bitten. The medical doctor had magnifying glass, was looking at the spot where he was bitten. The doctor could not see the bite mark. So a word to the wise is sufficient because most of the people who have died of rabies in the United States have died from bat bite exposures. But you know what? There are ways to get rabies and that's with cats and dogs. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people in America, particularly with cats who don't think that their cat needs rabies vaccines. And so they let their cats roam around and ravage the countryside, killing everything it can find. Of course, that cat is encountering wildlife and it's eating, eating, anim eating animals and sometimes can be contracting rabies through that, through that way and then bringing those rabies back to the household. So I'm gonna tell you right straight off, I would avoid petting petting animals. Uh, if you have the owner there, it's your it's your call. That's sort of a customer service thing. But I I tend not to be handling people's people's pets if I don't know them, because you don't know where that pet has been. And with cats, uh, you don't know where that cat has been. In California, we've had situations where cats have brought plague back to their owners. So uh, this is uh, cats are a real problem. Free range cats are. A, a significant issue, but they can also carry rabies. And so you can see all the different testings that have occurred here in the United States. This is data you can get from the CDC. So let's talk about some rabies myths. There's a lot of mythology out there in the public on rabies. You cannot diagnose rabies by looking at the animal, period. End of statement, nothing. It doesn't matter the time of day. It doesn't matter how the animal's behaving. It doesn't matter what the species is. You cannot identify an animal as rabid by looking at all you can say is the animal is acting normally or the animal is acting abnormally. That's it. 
Now you can treat the animal like it has rabies, but that doesn't mean it has rabies because a lot of, there's different diseases that can exhibit the same symptoms and signs as rabies, but not be rabies. Distemper is one of them. Okay, so an animal can have distemper and you may think, oh, it's out during the daytime, it looks sick, it's not acting right, it must have rabies. No, no, it just has distemper. So uh, don't fall for that. Just treat animals as animals, as wildlife, as potential disease vectors, and you'll probably be fine. If you care, leave them there. You have to have a rabies test to know an animal is rabid. And that usually re that requires the animal to be killed without damaging its brain. The brain is cut out and then put through a antibody test to see if it has rabies. So when you're, if you need to capture an animal, make sure you don't damage its head. That means you don't shoot it in the head. So you don't hit it with a tennis racket like people with bats. You wanna be sure that animal is captured and captured appropriately. And I have literature on that you can download from uh, various sites. Let's talk about hantavirus. Hantavirus is a viral infection spread through the droppings and urine of primarily the deer mouse or what we call paramiscus because it can be the deer mouse or the white footed mouse. Why is this an issue? Because you're gonna be crawling through areas where mice have been present and they're pooping and you may be aerosolizing that material, inhaling it and getting yourself in a few weeks later, you think, oh, I must have the flu. And you don't have the flu. You might've been exposed to hantavirus. A lot of people don't realize that deer mice are more common in the United States than we realize. And so I lived in Lincoln, Nebraska at one time, and I was in living in the middle of the city and I had deer mice in my house. So don't just simply assume that deer mice are a wilderness type animal. They are, but they are not, they could also be found in highly urbanized environments. I mean, Lincoln, Nebraska, a population of 275,000. So that was in the middle of the city. So we had deer mice there. So don't simply assume that, oh, it's a house mouse, it's no problem because you can't tell the droppings apart. A house mouse dropping versus a deer mouse dropping, you're not gonna tell that apart in the field. So uh, treat all mouse droppings as potential contaminants of uh, carriers of hantavirus so you protect yourself. So we'll talk about how you're gonna do that as well. What are the symptoms of hantavirus? Well, you feel like you have the flu, but with a few, with some cases, it gets more serious and you end up getting fluid, react, fluid buildup in your lungs. You can see the picture on the right, you'll notice that the lungs should be black because x-rays are negative images, but you see all this white. And the reason is, is because the lungs are filling up with fluid. So with hantavirus, you literally drown in your own liquid. You drown yourself because your body's reacting to this virus in such a radical way that your body's trying to fight it off and it creates all this liquid and you basically drown. The mortality rate is quite high, 30%. Even with modern medicine, it's quite high. Actually, it can be as high as almost 40%. So you see some data on the lower left-hand corner where places have occurred. Is it common? No, it's not common. But you don't want to be the lottery winner here. So when you're going into a confined place, space, make sure you're wearing your respirator. Make sure you're maybe air it out first. Think about, do I really need to crawl in there? Are there other ways of getting that inspection done? So this is a serious issue and it's more common. It's primarily a Western central, uh, central disease, but you can see some examples of it occurring even in the Eastern states. So uh, be aware of it. I'm not trying to create panic, but I just want us to avoid being cavalier and going in places and not having the proper protective equipment. Here's another infectious disease. This is called Bayless Ascaris procyonis, which is just the scientific name, meaning the round worm of the raccoon. Now, raccoons aren't the only animals that carry this particular disease, but the raccoons are a definitive reservoir for this particular organism, and it's shed through their feces. Now, I give you a picture here in the lower right-hand corner of raccoon toilets. Raccoons like to create these places where they defecate, and they defecate a lot. They're called toilets where they go back repeatedly. Mice, for example, do not create toilets. They just simply poop wherever they are. They're kind of let it wild and go free where raccoons go to a spot and they like to defecate right there and kind of marking of their territory sort of thing. The challenge here is that when 
these eggs persist in the soil and a child comes along and a child's playing in the soil and then sticks their fingers in their mouth, they can be exposing themselves to this particular worm and this worm can then burrow its way into their brain, cause blindness and sometimes even death. Can it happen to adults? Absolutely. Thankfully, it's rare because most of us aren't touching the ground and then shoving our fingers in our mouth. But this is something that can happen to you when you're crawling through an attic because raccoons will defecate and create toilets in attics. And if you're not careful, if you just get a little cavalier, start biting your fingernails, you can be exposed to this particular infection. How about some other issues? How about droppings around air exchange units? What do you think that might do for your client in terms of allergies or getting a dry cough or getting flu-like symptoms that they're being exposed to different contaminants? So this is why your inspection can be very, very important in terms of protecting your client's health. Here's an example of raccoon roundworm. You'll notice uh, the, the left-hand uh, image is your non-infective version, but after a few days when a raccoon sheds its feces in about seven to 10 days or so, so maybe up to 14, that that egg then becomes infective. And then you can see the worms from a single raccoon. And each one of those worms, as long as it's a female, is gonna be shedding uh, eggs in their feces. And so you can literally have hundreds of thousands of eggs being shed in the raccoon dropping. And how long will they persist in the environment? If it's moist, if it's a moist environment, it can be decades. Now the eggs do dry out if they're exposed to a dry environment, like a lot of addicts, but you don't know how long those eggs have been there. Have, it just, is it, have they been there five days or have they been there for 10 years, right? So you don't, you don't know. So you wanna treat all of those droppings as dangerous. My motto is this, people say, sometimes I'm too intellectual. Here's a quote for you and I want you to carry it with you. Poo is bad, don't touch that. So you wanna make sure it's about as simple as it gets here, folks. Don't touch poo. When you see poo, leave it alone, okay? And that will save you a world of hurt in a variety of ways. Now, the problem is sometimes you're in poo and you don't know it. And so that's why you wanna wear your, your, your protective equipment. Well, as I said before, here we have examples of the types of eggs. So this is 20 to 26,000 eggs per gram of feces. That's what you can get from a single raccoon coming out. So they require some time to embryonate. So the point is if a raccoon is pooping on you and it's fresh, you don't have to worry about raccoon roundworm. There may be other diseases you have to worry about, but it's not going to be raccoon roundworm. The point is, is that understand when you see these droppings, piles of droppings in attics or areas in a, on a property, for example, that is a potential biohazard and you want to treat it like that and probably inform your client as well. Where do we find these latrines? Well, typically they occur in these locations, although they can be found elsewhere, but the research out of California shows these types of spots are typical for raccoon toilets. Roofs, ground, wood piles. I don't know why they like to defecate in wood piles. The base of forks of trees, it seems that they like to poo in areas where they have uh, exposure to the sky. And then of course you have others. So when you are going around your house and looking into an attic, you wanna say, could there be a raccoon toilet in this attic? The answer is yeah, sure could. How about underneath the, underneath the deck? Absolutely. How about someone's wood pile? Certainly. So you want to make sure you're, you have your radar up. Sometimes we can get a little tunnel vision in our work and we forget to see the forest through the trees. You want to be sure you're thinking about what else could be here so that you don't allow your desire to be efficient and time work quickly without realizing that there could be animal activity here that poses a threat to you or to your client. So what are the clinical signs of infection? Well, you can see how vague they are. How about this? Skin irritations, eye and brain tissue damage, nausea. Here's the problem with trying to diagnose yourself. Don't do it because the vast majority of zoonotic diseases have flu-like symptoms. This is why when we train wildlife control operators, we're constantly telling them over and over again, when you go to your doctor, you tell your doctor what you do for a living. We actually have a little business card that we get, we hand them and we say, here, remember this is what I do for a living. These are some of the diseases I'm exposed to. Make sure when you're looking at my symptoms, you're considering that as a possibility because doctors are not trained to be thinking about zoonotic diseases. 
Why? Because most, because that's not normal in America. Now, if you're in some third world countries working, yeah, that would be more of an issue. But here in America, they're not thinking about it because it's not normal. So when they hear things like, oh, you have nausea or diarrhea, or maybe you have a cough or you have a temperature, they're thinking flu. They're not thinking, well, could this person be exposed to raccoon roundworm or could this person have been exposed to hantavirus? This is the problem. So you, this is why it's important if you're working with wildlife contaminated areas, you need to be sure your doctor knows. And this is why records are so important because is that cough you have, is it simply you caught it from your kid or is it something you contracted from the attic that you didn't wear your respirator at? Hey, Stephen. So how common is the worm? Hey, hey Stephen. Yes. Um, Katie on YouTube asks, um, are raccoons not harmed by roundworm? They're typically not. No, they are a, they would be a reservoir for it. They're like, they're almost like a, def, what's called a definitive host, not host in a negative way, but a host that this is the organism that carries this particular roundworm quite well. There are certain situations where there are so many worms in a raccoon that it does give them some intestinal blockage, but that's unusual. But no, raccoons seem to not suffer from it at all, other than they have to increase their caloric intake because the worm is consuming energy from them as well. Okay, so it's a true parasite in that regard. So this kind of gives you an idea of how common the roundworm is around the country. So here's the bottom line. Treat all poo as bad. Okay. So those of you in Key Largo, you say, hey, I'm okay. I, we don't have it down here. No, nah, that, that's, that, that problem is that test was done years ago. It could have changed since that time, right? So just assume the worst. It's called universal precautions. It's the same thing when you go to your doctor or you go to the hospital. They're all wearing gloves. They're all treating you like you're diseased, not because necessarily you are diseased, but because they're wanting to assume if they treat everyone as potential infectious, then they protect themselves, right? And so that's what you want to do when you're going to that house. You're going to ask the question, what diseases could I be exposed to at this particular house and act accordingly? How do you kill it? Well, it only takes 144 degrees to kill this particular roundworm. So it, it, you can kill it. The problem is, is you don't want to set your attic on fire if you see it. So fire is one of the ways to kill it. The point is, is that it can last a long time. The next slide, what about, how, can attic temperatures kill it? Not necessarily, but as I said before, it does dry out. So, Unfortunately, we don't, have, we don't have the research to say how long does it take, what are the environmental conditions that are necessary for those eggs to die in certain attic type environments. We don't have that kind of data. So if you have a choice to inspect a house uh, in June versus in August, well, August would be safer provided the raccoon hasn't deposited more gifts in that particular attic between June and August, because it would be drier, okay? How about histoplasmosis? Again, histoplasmosis is a fungal infection where when you breathe the spores of this fungus, you can have the fungus growing in your lungs and that causes an infection called histoplasmosis. It requires a nitrogen rich environment, which bat droppings can provide and bird droppings can provide. Particularly bird droppings in soiled areas. After if a tree roost in someone's yard has been had uh, had birds in it for two years or more, typically the soil underneath that tree will have histoplasmosis growing in it. The difference between bird droppings and bat droppings, bird droppings create the environment for histoplasmosis infection. Bat droppings actually contain the histoplasmosis fungal fungal spores. So they could, because bats groom them, the way they groom themselves, they're actually eating those spores and therefore they're defecating it, where birds, the droppings just create the conditions, which is a very subtle, subtle distinction. But again, we're going to treat all poo as, as bad. So when you're in an attic and you see a, a round group of droppings underneath an eave, that's a classic sign. You want to make sure you're avoiding that and not stirring that up. If the droppings are not disturbed, you shouldn't have a problem. But again, you're going to be wearing your respirator, right? 
So here's what happens with histoplasmosis. Notice the specks that you're seeing in these lung, lung tissues. Those are where the fungal spores are beginning to grow and interfering with this person's uh, breathing. And what happens, you feel fatigue, a dry cough. A lot of people think, oh, I just caught a cold. And most people actually recover in a couple of weeks. But the, vi but the histoplasmosis infection never goes away. It's just your immune system has suppressed it. So it can actually reemerge later in life when your immune system is suppressed. Those of you who are on medications to suppress your immune system are particularly vulnerable. Uh, I'm not a cigarette Nazi, so but if but if those of you who smoke, you are at greater risk because of uh, because of smoking removing the ability of your body to fight off certain forms of infection. So you're at greater risk against histoplasmosis because of that. So, but everybody, whether you smoke or whether you don't smoke, protect yourself when you're going into crawl spaces with your qualified respirator. How about other things? How about leptospirosis? You may not have heard of this. This is a bacterial infection. It's a pretty nasty one actually. It's transmitted through the urine and fluids of of animals that are infected. And this can occur, to, you could be infected by this by going through a crawl space that has been used as a toilet and you get cuts on your knees or cuts on your skin and the bacteria can actually enter through your skin area. So this is something beyond respiratory issues. This is where you can be exposed by cuts in your skin uh, and getting it that way. So you can actually get leptospirosis and it's quite it's quite a nasty disease. Thankfully, we have antibiotics to fight it, but it can be quite serious if uh, if it gets a hold of you. Even a broken skin or cut can infect you with this particular thing. So again, when you're walking through a crawl space, you're wearing proper protection, right? How about sylvatic typhus? Typhus, which just means a wilderness or wild typhus. It's spread by a louse. And for those of you who are in areas where you have uh, flying squirrels, like southern flying squirrels and northern flying squirrels, so typically they tend to be an east coast and a more uh, pine tree type uh, creature. So if you're living in an area where there's a lot of pine trees or evergreen trees, you will be in an area likely with uh, flying squirrels. And so you can see our flying squirrel toilet right here in this particular house. Notice how wet it looks because flying squirrels will pee and defecate at the time before they begin to exit the structure. And that is a classic sign of flying squirrel presence. So in the South, I think it was South Carolina, where a person was living within a, a house that had flying squirrels, they ended up getting sylvatic typhus from this louse. Again, quite rare. So I'm talking about things that are rather rare in our country, but we're, we're in a different situation because we're exposing ourselves more than the average American's going to be exposing themselves. So it may be rare in general, but we're not doing a rare we're rare people doing jobs that most people aren't doing. So this is why I'm mentioning it. because So our statistics are going to be higher than the general population. So just be aware of it that this can happen. How about ectoparasites? These are parasites on the outside of our body. Things like bird mites and ticks and fleas that I've mentioned. How about bed bugs? If we're going to look closely at this particular chair, so watch where you sit in someone's house, for instance, you may find yourself getting into where a bed bug is. Now, I'm, I'm going to flip back. You see the chair? You see the middle, the X here at the top? Let me get my cursor up right in here. Boom. There's a bed bug there. Do you see all the blood splattering here? This is where the bed bug is fed and then defecated, and then you get these black spots. So watch where you watch where you sit, watch where you kneel, watch where you put your hands, because you may have a, a visitor coming home with you that's going to be quite unpleasant for you. Bed bugs look very similar to bed bugs. So, uh, but they're a different species but they have some of the same behaviors as bed bugs. The point is we just want to be aware that there are ectoparasites that you can expose yourself to when you're going into a structure. How about bat ticks? This is relatively rare, but they do occur. This is a soft-shelled tick. Most of us are going to be familiar with the hard-shell ticks. 
presently we have no evidence that they transmit disease to us but you know i'd always be cautious when you have when, when you hear that word presently because it probably means we haven't done enough research yet so um anything that's a blood feeder i'd be nervous about so uh just be aware that this is going to be something that's around when you have bat infestations in particular houses and the real challenge is when the bats get removed the ticks often are, they don't stay on the bat. They feed and then leave the bat. So when the bats are gone, they have to then search for a new host and then they're searching for people. How about pigeons and bacteria? We talked about some bird droppings here. Here's an example again, poo is bad, don't touch that. But if you're going into an area where an attic where there's all kinds of bird droppings, there's other things besides histoplasmosis to be concerned about. You have Campylobacter jejuni and Chlamydia psittaceae. These are bacterial infections that we can contract. Now again, these are extraordinarily rare infections. But for those of you that have weakened immune systems, maybe you're on, on immune suppressing drugs, or maybe you have diabetes, or maybe you're undergoing uh, cancer treatments that will also damage your immune system, you are particularly vulnerable to this. It doesn't mean those of us who are healthy are not vulnerable to it, but again, it's a qualitative change here. This is why it's important for you to wear your PPE. How about p pigeons and allergies? This is some something I think happened to me in my work. I have some chronic uh, allergies that I struggle with. I think my work with wildlife over the years uh, increased my allergic reaction because an allergic reaction is where our body is reacting to a protein that it doesn't like anymore. And if we're exposed to that protein over and over and over again, for some people, their immune system starts treating it like an enemy. That's what an allergy is. So when you're dealing with birds, they've, the research has found that people that are, have birds on the outside of a building and they're constantly pooping, that those proteins from the droppings can be getting into the house and over time, a certain portion of the population will develop allergies to those droppings, and, and that is a problem. So it's how often you're exposed, the volume of your exposure, and how sense can determine your sensitivity. So it's not just simply infections that we need to be concerned about. It's also that we could develop allergic reactions later in our career if we're not being careful with our exposure. It's just one of the hazards of working in these environments. So now that I've probably scared some of you, let's talk about risk. How do we, how do we explain risk? Because I've talked about things are low. These are not common infections. But risk is the potential for exposure, which is how frequently are you exposed and how long are you exposed times the severity of the outcome. In other words, if I'm, if I'm saying, what's the likelihood of my getting into a car crash driving to the store. You may say, well, I'm only gonna be in the car for five minutes. I'm only doing it once a week. I'm a good driver. I have a really good car. It has an A plus safety rating. So the severity of the outcome is maybe I have a fender bender. That's a pretty low risk. But when we're dealing with something like rabies, you say, well, what's the likelihood of my getting rabies? Well, I'm not handling bats. I'm not catching animals. <clears throat> it's gonna be pretty low. But the severity of the outcome, if I contract rabies, the, I die. So that's a, pretty severe, that's a pretty severe risk, even though the possibility of it's quite low. How about flying? How about inspecting a house? Well, you have physical risks. Will I fall off the ladder? But now I've given you additional risks. Are you being exposed to a zoonotic disease? So how do we, how do we mitigate that risk? properly so that we become sane in our work. And so we want to be sure you say, well, Stephen, I've never heard of people contracting these diseases. This is why. Our immune system fights it off. Sometimes we just get lucky. Sometimes we had it, we caught it and our body fought it off. And we thought it was something else. Oh, I caught it from the kids. Or we didn't get enough exposure to to convert to that particular disease. Those are great at risk. I've already mentioned this, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but obviously if you have a weakened immune system, you're gonna be at a greater risk than other, than other people. So how do we mitigate this risk? I'm not telling you all to quit your jobs and work at a desk job in a, in a, in a store or something. No, that's not what I'm saying, is that when we implement certain prudent behaviors the risk of us contracting one of these drops dramatically. 
beyond the low risk you already have right now. So you wanna consider your situation. It's different from climbing on the roof of a building than crawling into a crawl space. Why? Because crawl space concentrates things. Sun kills a lot of disease, okay? Also, you have more air. So the solution to pollution is dilution. So those are some other things. Consider your behavior. If you're going over and playing in the raccoon toilet, well, obviously that's a problem, but I doubt any of you are gonna do that. But you want to be aware of this particular issue. We change our behavior, we change what we're wearing, we can protect ourselves. Don't expose yourself if you don't have to. If you see the pile of droppings, don't crawl through it. It noted on your report, say that's an area I can't inspect. However, you have an animal problem or did have an animal problem at one time. Make sure you're wearing your, your personal protective equipment. What am I referring to here? I recommend as a minimum, a half-face HEPA filter mask. I really don't like half-face anymore. I really prefer you to wear a full face. Those of you who have beards have got to get rid of the beard. Sorry, but you can't have a beard that's going to interfere with the seal of your respirator. So you got to make sure you're fit, taste, fast, fit tested so that you're healthy enough. Go through the health requirements to make sure you're healthy enough to wear a respirator. Get it fit, tated so it, fit tested so it's properly fitted to your body and then do your seal checks. Make sure you wear it and wear it well. I know it's a pain. Wearing a respirator in the middle of the summer crawling through an attic is a pain. I get it. But it's really worse being in a hospital because you caught a lung infection from something where you could have protected yourself wearing a respirator. There's me in the old days. I should have had a full face. I was wearing a half face. This is what, don't learn from my mistakes. So when you're inspecting above a drop ceiling, this is how you don't do it. Never, you don't know it's above that drop ceiling. There could be a pile of bad guano up there and that you could dump on yourself and dump on the floor and aerosolize right in front of you. All it can take is one breath, one inhalation, and you can be infected with histo. This is better, but notice I'm not even wearing gloves. So here's an example of don't do as I do, do as I say. So I'm not trying to be a holier than thou here. I've cut corners, I get it point is, is I'm, you know, we're human. I'm just encouraging you do the right thing. I understand it costs you money. It's costing you time. It's costing you. I get it. I do get it. I'm just saying that sometimes if you ever thought, you know, if you've been speeding and all of a sudden you got into a car accident, did it really save you that much time? Don't forget your gloves and booties. How much protection do you need? That's all contextual. I'm suggesting at the base minimum, full face respirator in crawl spaces and you're wearing gloves. If you're seeing, you know, if you're gonna be getting into an area with lots of insulation, a Tyvek suit's probably not a bad idea. If you see something, then you can certainly respond to it and then maybe stop, get your, get your full Tyvek suit on or make a decision you're not going to inspect any further. If I'm going through a place like a crawl space uh, underneath a deck or an area where I think that, you know, cats have been present or dogs or animals have been present in, you, I'm going to strongly recommend that you wear your Tyvek suit. Make sure you have appropriate knee pads as well so you're not cutting yourself as you're crawling along. And then when you get home, you're going to strip off all the stuff Put your dirty clothes into the laundry, shower before you hug your kids. There have been instances where people have had contaminated clothing and their children come up. You know how kids come up and hug you on your legs and the dust that came off of the, the pant legs infected their children. Okay, rare, absolutely, extraordinarily rare, but you don't want to be the lottery winner on this. Okay, so remove your PPE properly because you can contaminate, because remember there's contamination on the outside of that. So make sure you know how to, how to remove that properly so you're not contaminating yourself and then store your mask properly after you've cleaned it. So how much protection you need depends on your context. Where are you going? And you kind of know if you're dealing with a house that's 100 years old, there's probably a greater risk there than a house that was just built. Okay. So 
the same way you have to get a feel and I'm going to have to, tr you have to sort of trust yourself because otherwise you're going to, you know, death con one for everything. And that's not going to be realistic, but you want to be able to identify and say, what could be in here and act appropriately? What's the particular threat that I could face here? And we'll give you some examples of what some of those threats are and how to identify them. So context, notice we have a difference. Bird poo in both, both locations, one is less risky. Why? Because you're outdoors. So the solution to pollution is dilution. I would stay upwind, but also here's we have bird poo in, the, in an attic and enclosed space that you're crawling through. So the, the one on the left is a greater threat to you than the one on the right, because you can just walk around that dumpster. Say, yep, birds have certainly been getting into that. Do you smoke? How healthy are you? Are you taking precautions? Are you, I, would, I hope all of you have your uh, sanitation equipment in your vehicle after you're shaking hands with a client, hands are dirty. Uh, so you wanna be sure you probably don't have access to water very easily. Are you washing your hands after you contact clients? Are you keeping your hands away from your face, away from your mouth? Are you sharing, are you sharing pens, pens and pencils with your clients? I would encourage people, look, have a, have a set of pens, pens and pencils. Uh, and then when the person signs, whatever, they can keep the pen and pencil so you don't have to touch it again. Because the flu is out there as well. It's not all, so not all zoonotic. Sometimes it's just we catch diseases from our clients as well. So you want to be thinking about that and staying healthy. This is the card I was telling you about that you want to show your doctor. This is something you can download from the internet. It's called the USDA Medical Alert Card. Now, I'm not going to read all this for you, but the point is, is if you look at it carefully, and just notice some of the names, you're basically going to scare the daylights out of your doctor is what you're going to do. So now your doctor has to think back into time and to the, to the zoonotic disease class, infectious disease class that he took or she took and have to dredge all that up and start thinking about what we call zebras. So these are the unusual diseases that we might have that the general public won't have, okay? It's just a way to kind of wake your doctor up. I got an infection once, I had a mono spot done, that was negative, I had a whole series of bacterial tests done, those were all negative. They never did find out what caused it. It felt like I got hit by a bus. I, I was so weak and tired and this went on for well over a month. After I finally recovered, I told my doctor, I said, you know, I work with wildlife. He said, oh, I forgot. So again, I don't blame my doctor for that, right? That's on me. Because I remember I'm old enough in this industry where we didn't have all the information we have today, right? So I was doing a lot of stupid stuff back in the day. I don't want you to do that. But the point is, is that we never found out what it was. I think it was because I was doing some mouse work in a, at a house. And I think that house had, I think I might've had Hanta. Don't know. Can't, it's too late. I don't know what it was, but we never did find out what it was. But it took me out. I was only working probably a few hours a day. I, I felt like I, I felt terrible. So don't let that be you. This is something you can use to your doctor, download it, put it in your own, put it in your wallet hand it to your doctor each time, just to remind them, say, hey, you know, if I'm not feeling well, think about things beyond just the ordinary flu or cold. If you wanna learn more about histoplasmosis, this is a government document. I don't call it free because our taxes have paid for it. You all know that anything the government does is not free. I hate it when politicians call stuff free. It's not free. It's just, you don't have to pay for it again. Okay, so um, I really, that. One of my pet peeves when I work, I work for the government. So I always tell people the stuff isn't free. You just don't have to pay for it again. So um, this is a wonderful document for you to, to get if you want to learn more. The first half of it is the most important for you, unless you're wanting to learn how to clean it up. It's written in English. And I mean that in a very sarcastic way, because some of this technical literature can be quite difficult to, to wade through. This is quite a good document and it will really help you out. Why do I mention histoplasmosis so much? Because if you're protecting yourself against histoplasmosis, you're pretty much protecting yourself from everything else. If you know how to do that, you're pretty much good for almost everything else. So it's sort of like asbestos. You know, if you can protect yourself against asbestos, you're pretty much good for almost anything else. Well, the same way in disease area, histo is really the way to go and it can be quite informative for you. Another document, if you're looking to learn more about zoonotics, uh, is a field manual put out by, uh, it's called Squidus. 
from the University of Georgia. Again, this is a very short manual. A lot of diseases are not transmittable to humans, but if you want to know what's what that duck has, what infection that duck has, for example, it'll tell you that. But it'll also talk about some quick tips about some zoonotic infections as well. And again, that's written in a very user-friendly sort of way, and that can be helpful for you because it can be kind of overwhelming. All right, let's move on away from diseases and let's talk about wildlife physical threats. Dog bites. Notice the numbers we have here, 4.7 million a year, of which 800,000 require medical attention. So notice the little sign we have here. Can you make it to the fence in two minutes, two seconds? Well, the dogs can. Children, 16 year old or younger, are the ones most likely to die from a dog attack. Why does this affect you? Because there may be dogs present when you're doing your inspection. So it's not always wildlife, domestic species can impact you as well. Wildlife attacks, fortunately, are exceedingly rare, extraordinarily rare. So usually what happens is that the animal is not attacking so much as the animal is trying to defend itself because it feels that you're threatening it. Here's the rule of thumb. When you see an animal, move away. Just move away. But what happens is, you know, people say all the time, well, I'm afraid of snakes and they have to go over and kill it. Well, if you're afraid of snakes, go away from the snake. Why are you trying to attack the snake? So it doesn't make any, doesn't make any sense. And by the way, many snakes rattle their tails. So just because an animal rattles its tail doesn't make it venomous. All right. And so and if it's venomous, you don't want to go near it in the first place. So it, it, the behavior that people have, the psychological therapy that they need is truly remarkable. Uh, but if but snakes are not out looking to bite us. Just leave them alone. Wildlife attacks like with geese, now geese are gonna be a little bit more aggressive. You get too close to their nest and the gander will come at you. Uh, and it could be quite uh, troublesome. Alligators, of course, you get too close to water. Alligators can certainly lunge out of the water and attack you as well. So you wanna keep your wits about you, but again, Avoid animals knowing where you are and knowing the particular threats. Know your particular environment. We have grizzly bears here in Montana, but typically grizzly bears aren't attacking home inspectors going into houses. But if you're out in the woods fishing and you have a pile of fish with you, and you get too close to a mama bear and her cubs, there's going to be a problem. Okay, so, but those again are quite rare indeed. How about snake bites? Here's something, a statistic that most people don't understand about snake bites. 30% of all rattlesnake bites are dry. What that means is there's no venom being uh, transmitted. And here's another statistic for you. 60% of all snake bites are, uh, occur when a person is drunk or having consuming alcohol. You know, they hold my beer and they're often with pets. And so the issue here is that people, people are overstating the risk of certain things. Now, that being said, we do have a growing community in the United States where they're getting exotic pets. Some of these exotic pets are legal. Many times they're not legal. I'm thinking of something like a black mamba. Black mamba is an extraordinarily aggressive snake. It's not native to the United States. It's from Africa. If you ever look up Google black mambas, it'll scare the living daylights out of you. They have, I think they're the fifth most venomous snake in the, in the world and they're territorial. So they will seek out, they will seek out people where most American snakes won't seek out people. This one will defend its territory. Uh, so, but again, it's just something you want to keep in the back of your mind or is it possible that there's some exotic animals in this house that may have gotten away that they didn't tell you about? You know, don't know. I think it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. How about structural integrity with wildlife? We're now moving over to the inspection side. Wildlife can damage property and can damage it severely. The picture on the right was a half inch piece of plywood, brand new. The carpenter thought that the squirrel had left the house and thought, well, I'll just close the door behind the squirrel. Well, he was correct. The squirrel did leave the house. The problem was is he forgot about the young the squirrel left behind. So, so female squirrel came back, gnawed through half inch brand new plywood. Let me give you a clue here. Tree squirrels are beaver that climb. 
we need to appreciate the power that they have in their jaws. I'm not talking about flying squirrels. I'm not talking about red squirrels. I'm talking about fox squirrels and gray squirrels. They're beaver that climb, and that gives you an indication of what that squirrel can do. Here in the left-hand picture, it's a little hard to see, but you'll see that little groove where I'm looking, taking this picture through the water because a chipmunk burrowed underneath this person's pool, and then the weight of the water collapsed the tunnel stretching the liner. So the damage can be quite severe when people have certain wildlife issues. Here's an example of mouse activity. One of my pet, pet projects is trying to get people in America to understand how devastating mice are to a structure. I think Mickey Mouse has done a lot of damage to our country, okay? Disney has done a lot of damage to our country because people think that animals talk and they think that they could have a, a communion with these animals. And so Mickey Mouse has done this. Notice this after just a few short weeks, mice have riddled through this insulation. This was a particular study done out of the University of Nebraska. This is happening over time. So when people have mice, I'm not even talking about disease here. I'm just talking about what did this do to the R value of this particular structure? And mice are doing that all the time. So if you have a situation with mice, take it seriously. This is damaging this person's property. How about bird droppings and roofs? Again, we're not talking about disease here. We're talking about weight. Dry weight of bird droppings is 18 pounds per cubic foot. Now, what happens when you have birds on top of a, a gas station roof here, and then it rains? The poo has clogged the downspouts, and now that's all filling up with water. Do you think some of those have collapsed? Uh, the answer is yes, some of them have collapsed. How about buildings where they haven't taken the time to close off the windows, and you have pigeons flying in and out day after day after day? Those pigeons are dropping feces in those particular buildings. Do you think the weight of that over time is going to affect that attic or that particular floor? Absolutely, it's going to. And it's not necessarily going to be dry weight either. How about rodents and wires? Rodents have a tendency to gnaw. That's what they do. They always gnaw. Now, people think they gnaw to grind down their teeth. Well, they do, but they don't have to gnaw on an external object. They can actually gnaw on their own teeth to grind their teeth down because their incisors are constantly growing. But if they have something else available, hey, why not? It tastes, it, it feels good. They can gnaw off the, the rubber off this particular wire. The wire on the right is a conduit wire in a power substation, gnawed by a tree squirrel. So again, these fires that occur in structures that are old, some of them are caused because people have allowed rodents to be present in those structures and they're gnawing wires and finally there's a short and all of a sudden the house mysteriously lights up. Do you all know how to use a mirror? Mirrors are important. You can actually use a good mirror and shine a light on it and reflect behind areas that you can't see. So you can do a lot with a flashlight, a good strong flashlight and a mirror to look into areas that you can't quite see with your ordinary eyes because you can't reach that particular area. So definitely get used to using a mirror. This is why I recommend people having a good spotlight. This is different from using a flashlight. I'm talking about a spotlight. A spotlight is a dedicated light with a very high intensity beam. I like a million candle power, or if we're going into lumens, perhaps over a thousand lumens with a nice concentrated tight beam. And the reason is, is I want you to look at this photo and I want you to ask the question, can you see the hole? Now, the answer to the question is no, you can't. Can you see it now? Do you know where the bats are getting in now? Do you know where the bats are getting in? Do you know where the bats are getting in? That's what of you say, well, Stephen, how do you know that? Well, because when you're using a powerful light and you illuminate a dark spot, if the dark spot stays dark, it means the light is not reflecting back to you. That means there's a gap. And bats only need three-eighths of an inch to get in. And that's how the bats were getting in. So eaves, uh, ridge vents, are a common problem for houses. A lot of new houses, of course, have ridge vents. A lot of them are not installed very well. In our industry, uh, we usually love contractors because they make so much work for us. Um, because they're, they only care about water. They're not thinking about wildlife.
So how do we do some inspection? So we're getting into more of the inspection principles. This is something I would certainly suggest for you before you even get to the house, and that is uh, swoop in with a Google Earth. Get Google Earth and swoop in and check the house out from a distance. You know, what kind of ladders would you might need? What kind of obstructions? Now, granted, there is a time delay because you don't know how long ago that, uh, that, that shot was taken. It could maybe five years, but it gives you a start to start the process, particularly if you're able to talk to the client, you're able to fly in while they're on the phone, you're able to talk to the person and then verify that the picture you're seeing from Google is still accurate with the person's client. It might save you, a, it might save you some time and effort, particularly when you have to bring some specialized equipment. When we're talking about inspection, I want you to think about what I call the inspection theory of zones. And what that means is you know that certain parts of a community are in better repair than other parts of a community. You know that certain parts of a community might have more challenges with wildlife because there may be water nearby, there may be a woods nearby, uh, and you get a sense of where that is. So when you know that certain parts of the city that you're working in are going to have different types of problems than other parts of the city. And that's the first line of defense when you're thinking about inspection for wildlife. Know the species in your particular state and area, and then say, where are those animals going to be located in my particular community? Then you're going to think about the habitat of the area. When you're driving up to that house, how does the house look from a distance? How does the neighborhood look? Are there bird feeders around? Are there, is there trash all over the place? Is it well kept? Is this an animal friendly location? Animal friendly meaning there's lots of debris, there's lots of food, there's lots of water, there's lots of broken buildings where animals can find shelter, or is this a, a non-animal friendly? I'm not talking about pets and cats, although that's part of it because a lot of people that feed their pets and cats outdoors are creating food availability for wildlife as well. So you wanna think about how does this area look? How does this house look? Is it in good repair or is it in bad repair? Get that big picture. Is it clean? Notice the tree branch hanging over this particular structure. That's a, that's a squirrel highway. Now, is a squirrel using it? I don't know. I'd have to inspect the building. But when you see that, that makes it very easy for an animal to access that particular roof. Does it mean that the animal can't access it without that tree branch? No, but we're talking about ease of access. Think of it like the locking the door to your house. Can a burglar get through the lock of the door of your house? Absolutely. So why do you lock your house? Well, you do it to slow the burglar down. If you want to slow them down more, you get deadbolts. If you want to slow them down more, you may get an alarm. If you want to slow them down more, you may get a big dog. Those so there's levels of security. So when you're looking at a structure, you're gonna say, well, you know, is there tree branches there? Does it look clean? Is it repaired? Is there food around? And that'll tell you what, what's the likelihood that this is gonna be a house with a lot of animal issues. Bird feeders, when I was in business, were my best friend. That is money in the bank. You almost want to kiss your client on the mouth because there's going to be there's going to be wildlife problems in that building. People will say, "Oh, Stephen, the the mice are so far away. They, I have it so far away." And I said, "It's fine. The mice will just take longer to get to your house. Not a problem. They'll travel." So when you have food resources, food means wildlife. So this is what we call supply side economics. A lot of people don't understand supply side economics. Supply side economics says this, where there is a supply, there will be a demand to meet it. So when you create a supply of food here, wildlife will grow in numbers to meet the supply that you have given them. So when you see bird feeders on your client's property, you should automatically just assume it that they have mice unless proven otherwise. Just assume it because they've got it. And don't, and, and don't hear this nonsense, oh, I have a cat. That's nonsense, okay? Cats are not that good at mouse control. Cats are good at killing everything they can find. That's certainly true, but they're not good at mouse control. It's one, some of the mythologies we have. So other clues that a house has animal problems is the proverbial owl. I call this a cry for help. Whenever you see an owl, you know this person's crying for help. They don't know what they're doing because owls are useless. The best thing they're good for is a bank. You know, put a hole in the top and use them as a savings bank. Here we have an example of rodent bait stations. Now, that's a good thing, provided they're being actively maintained, but it does show that there have been challenges in the past with, with rodents, but the person's doing something about it, okay, which is fine. So, 
wildlife damage occurs in two different forms. Domicile damage, that is where the animal is living on the property, and transient damage where the animal is either feeding on the property or just simply moving through. Most of what we're going to talk about here is domicile damage. I haven't really focused on identification of damage in gardens and that sort of thing. So we're going to focus on the domicile damage, damage caused by the animal living on the property. So let's talk about how you need to see. In order to be a good inspector, you have to think about, do you know how to observe? And this is becoming increasingly difficult for us in America because we're so enamored with our cell phones, we've lost the ability to truly look at things. And by look, I mean, look at our field of vision. When we're normally looking around a room, we have 140 degree field of vision. But I want you to focus your attention on one spot. When you're doing an inspection, and you might be doing this naturally, you're not even consciously thinking about it, but to really observe certain signs of animals, because remember, animals are not looking to make their presence known, so we have to look for their presence. You have to learn how to look carefully. Is, that, is there a smudge mark on that paint? where the animal's body oils have darkened that because you because it may not be very dark. I'm going to show you some pictures that are quite dark to just kind of illustrate it, but when you're looking at areas with minimal infestation or maybe early infestation, you have to learn how to look very, very carefully and you have to look at spot, at spot, at spot. For example, take a look at this particular picture and tell and ask yourself, what do you see? Did you see it? Now, granted, this is not a fair test, but I'm trying to illustrate the importance of how you have to, to be a true seer. You have to look at spot to spot to spot. You can't just simply gestalt it. You can't look at the entire picture. You do that when you do your initial drive up. When you walk into a room, you want to get the big picture, but then you have to narrow your focus down to spot, to spot, to spot, to make sure, are you missing any clues being left by the animals that are, that are there? So animal sign cat falls into various categories. I'm going to focus on primarily two, and we'll have sometimes occasionally the third one where it travels, okay? So poop, and living areas are gonna be primary in terms of our inspection process here. So here's a diagram of a house. All of these particular spots noted are areas where animals enter a building. The rule of thumb is wherever two joint, wherever a joint is, wherever two surfaces meet, that's a seam, that is an area that's vulnerable to animal entry. Very rarely do animals go through go through a board directly. Often they'll go through where two boards meet. Now there are exceptions, but as a general rule, it's where there's ever a, a form of a breach of a house. So this, these are the areas that you'd wanna focus your attention at if you're looking to find where animals are getting inside of the structure. So how do you know how an animal is entering the structure? Well, I like to inspect from the outside of the structure first. Why? Because the animal has to break the exterior of the building in order to get in, and it's often easier to find that opening from the outside than it is from the inside, okay? Because there's a lot of barriers on the inside of a structure, as I'm sure many of you already know. So what are the rules of thumb to how to identify what animal got in? And so here's a rule of thumb for you. So if you're talking with a client, you know, do you have a hole in your house that's a great size of a grapefruit? Why do I say grapefruit? Because most people don't know what four inches is. They don't think that way. It's not being rude. It's just that they're not carpenters. They're not working with a ruler all day long. So they can't perceive the, what four inches, but they know what a grapefruit looks like, what a tennis ball looks like. So notice what I said there, a raccoon only needs four inches to get inside of a house. So if you can stick your fist into it, a raccoon can get into it. You say, how is it possible? Because most people don't compensate for the big hair. Raccoons have big hair, okay? So squirrels only need a tennis ball. Rats need a golf ball. Mice need a pencil, okay? So if you can inspect for mice, you can inspect for everything else. That's a piece of cake, okay? So we're gonna talk about some sign when you're looking at a building saying, what could possibly be here? 
bats. One of the easiest ways to look for bats is to look for their guano. Okay, they're, they're, they're defecating as they're exiting the structure. Sometimes they're defecating when they're coming into the structure. Here in the lower, uh, the upper left, we're gonna go kind of clockwise here. The bats are defecating on this, on this particular sill. That's pretty obvious. If you can't, if you, I would hope all of you could see that. That's pretty, that's pretty obvious. There's gonna be bat guano there. There's a problem. How about this with a chimney though? You see the gap between these two flues? Bats were flying in and out of that. How about the lower right? You see that, you see that white area? You know what caused that? Because bats, when they were getting into this attic, they landed on that spot and broke away the paint and then crawled into the gap. How about the lower left-hand photo? That's a cobweb with bat droppings in it. When was the last time you looked at cobwebs on a house to see if there were droppings in it? Okay. More typically, if you're seeing bat droppings along this foundation sill in the on the upper left, and then of course you see that guano pile, that's classic, classic droppings. If you ever have people telling you, well, you know, I have droppings on my deck and I sweep them every day and they keep reappearing, that's bats. Okay, that, that's the animal doing that. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. I know many of you may not have those types of conversations with your clients per se, but the reality is that is one, one clue. So whenever you see that sort of circular type design, that's gonna be classic bat. And I'm gonna give you some tips on identifying guano here uh, in, a, in a bit. How about mouse habitat? Just assume mice are everywhere. Mice are, mice are one of the most, uh, most successful mammals in the world because house mice, for example, have, have thrive in human impacted environments. They're actually called the commensal rodent because they share our table. It's from the Latin word commensal meaning share table. So they actually share our table, which they do. So whenever you see areas like this grassland out here, that's a mouse factory. And so those mice, as they're reproducing, are gonna be looking for structures for the winter time to live in, and they're gonna move across the street and get into that particular house. When you see things like wood piles, that's structure. Mice need structure, why? Because when you're small and everything eats you, you need a place to hide. And when the more structure you have, the more likely you're gonna have a mouse nest into that particular house, structure and house. Here's an example of my house. Again, I don't wanna make it sound like I'm a holier than thou here. This is my house when I was back in Lincoln, Nebraska. This is a mouse nest in the corner of my attic. They were climbing up a vine that was going along this particular pole and created a huge nesting area there. How about this particular house on the right, this, this brick house? Notice the gap you see between the brick and that fascia there. All the mouse has to do is climb the brick, not very hard for them to do, and squeeze along the mortar joint between that sill and get right into the attic. We often think of mice coming into a structure at the ground level or at the foundation level. That's true, but they, they're more than willing to climb a little bit to get into an attic as well. So we have to be looking high and low. How about this particular gap? Remember I told you the gaps in structures where two surfaces meet, that is where animals are entering. Why? Because when you have two surfaces, they're not gonna heat at the same rate. The sun's gonna beat, beat on them at different rates. And so they're gonna expand at different rates and therefore there's gonna be a gap created over time because of the difference in, in the way that, that those surfaces are responding to heat and expansion and contraction. I call this mouse scaffolding. This is where the person wanted to make it easier for mice to enter the house. So they wanted to be sure the mouse had something to climb on. Uh, how about pipes? Pipes are notorious uh, for allowing access into structures. Uh, again, I just, that's, a huge, that's a thick pen. That's more than, that's a highway for mice getting into a house. A lot of people underestimate how well mice can climb. The weakest mouse can jump almost 10 inches vertical. Now imagine what the mice, do you see under that garage door? Now garage doors are tough, but there are products out there that will resolve that. But those, that's a particular gap. How about this particular 
uh, situation here. Here we're in an attic now, and we're looking down on the left-hand picture. We're looking down at the blown-in insulation. Now it looks like someone took a uh, a ping pong ball and rolled it all around the insulation. Well, that's not a ping pong ball. Those are mouse trails. Remember I talked about the importance of wearing your respirator before you open the hatch. You don't open the hatch, put on your respirator because you don't know what was above the hatch, right? Everything needs to be on before you disturb anything. So here we have now, uh, when mice are walking around, they're peeing and pooping all over the place. That's what they do. So you don't want to be crawling around in this or even sticking your head up here without having the proper protection. Here we have, it's a little harder to see, but if you look carefully at it in the middle, you'll see a trail going from the corner in the upper right, up, upper right here, down through here. See the trail? That's another mouse trail. So blown insulation can teach you a lot. For those of you who are dealing with fiberglass insulation, if you take the time to just lift some of that insulation to see the, uh, uh, the, the board underneath it, you'll often see trails or droppings underneath that as well. Gnaw damage, if you measure it, mice, mice gnaws are two millimeters wide, rat gnaws are four millimeters wide. How about chipmunks going up the corners of houses? You'll find a lot of your, a lot of your houses here have gaps in the corners here, often gaps along the sill plate that, might, that chipmunks can explore. You've already seen the photo of the pool. Here's some other shots here. There were three different holes underneath this pool. Now that person's had you know, their liner stretched and liners, as you probably know, are very expensive. Here's a mound of soil because that's all been excavated by a chipmunk creating a burrow. Now, for those of you living in pocket gopher country, you might think, well, pocket gopher created that. No, no, no. In this case, this is all, this is all from one chipmunk burrowing out a, a den. Now, imagine what type of structural damage might occur if this was on a, if this was on a hill where they were trying to do uh, an embankment, how that would destabilize that embankment over time. So that could be a problem. How about rats? So here we have some sebum. Sebum is just the body oils off the animal that then can be deposited on a surface. Notice where my blue pen is. You see that little brown mark there? That's from the rats hugging the wall as they're turning the corner. Just like when you have a favorite book, if you notice, if you look at it carefully, the oils on your hands have made certain pages darker than others. Well, that's the same thing that's coming off the body oils of these particular rodents. That's why you have to look carefully to see the subtle distinction and change in color from one surface to another, because if you're not looking carefully enough at it, you'll miss it. Structure, they hit a, they hit a vertical beam and then start digging. So you're looking at a hole two inches wide. Here's an example of a rat gnawing, uh, or actually might be mouse gnawing up there. I wasn't exactly sure which that one was. And then lower right hand corner, is another rat burrow. These are all from New York City, by the way, except the one in the middle. That one's from Nebraska. Here we have a rat trail in the lower left-hand corner. Notice I use a pen to show the si relative size of that particular trail. This is all downtown Manhattan in this lower left-hand corner and also the lower right corner. So Man Manhattan is just famous for rats. It's, a, it's an amazing place. Snakes. What happens if you find a snake skin? I bet many of you out there have found snake skins in an attic. Well, here's, here's what that will tell you. Obviously, there's a large enough gap to let the snake in, but also that the snake is up there hunting for rodents. And here's some good news, that the snake skin is a third longer than the snake actually was. So if it's three feet long, then the snake's probably around two feet long. Okay, so uh, not a big deal. Just something to think about because sometimes people can get quite paranoid about how big the snake is. Just realize that the snake skin's longer than the snake actually was. Flying squirrels. You've seen the picture in the upper hand, upper left, upper left hand corner already. But here's another example of the droppings. Here we have the air intake for a, uh, a roof. Notice the brown staining. Now it's very subtle because about the importance of focusing your attention. It's very subtle, but you see that staining, that's all caused by flying squirrel droppings that have stained those particular openings. In the bottom picture, right in this corner here, I hope you can see my cursor, right above the downspout is where flying squirrels were getting into this particular structure. Flying squirrels only need about a half inch gap 
So silver dollar to a little something a little bit lower that they can get it does not take much for them to get in. Brown staining is classic for flying squirrels because of the defecation and urination at the same time. And here's some other pictures. Here we have what, what it looks like when they're inside of an attic on top of insulation. And here's another shot of that particular air intake area for the attic. How about red squirrels? Here we have, uh, look at the snow on the roof. That can often tell you something. Here's a trail right on the snow of the roof where an animal is moving in and out. Sometimes they'll, that makes it very easy. Don't even need a ladder to find that. But if you're looking at the, the screen, what I call the mosquito netting, here we have two holes here and here that a red squirrel was using to access this particular attic. So this is why I'm not a big fan of mosquito netting because it works great to keep out mosquitoes, but it's not very durable. This is why all screens need to be screened with quarter inch hardware cloth on the exterior of the building. If you see a pile of pine cones, that's cloud squirrel, because red squirrels are different than gray and fox squirrels. Gray and fox squirrels are what's called scatter caches. They'll take one nut, deposit it in the, in the yard, take another nut, deposit it elsewhere in the yard. Red squirrels do it differently. They pile all their food in one spot. Uh, you can take out a garbage can bag full of, of these in an attic, or sometimes you'll see them in downspouts. That's classic sign of red squirrel. Here's some other examples of damage with gray and fox squirrel. Here they have gnawed on the, the lead flashing of this particular chimney. Here they've hopped across a particular uh, uh, snow area. Here they've gnawed into the corner of the building. Again, you're looking for that baseball size hole. And here's another example in the corner where they've gone in. And you, if you check, check gutters, gutters can tell you a lot sometimes. When you're seeing a lot of debris in gutters, that's often giving you a clue. Something is not right in this particular house. Sometimes squirrels will just gnaw right through the wall. Here's an example. Notice I call them beaver that climb. Got to respect the squirrels. If you see uh, acorns or larger walnut shells like this, squirrels and rats have the ability to gnaw, the, to gnaw in half. Mice have to gnaw at the end because they don't have the jaw power but a squirrel will break it right in half because of their jaw power. Here's an example of where they're gnawing on electrical wires as well. You have to get up and close and personal. Here's where a squirrel was climbing this stone and then slipped underneath the vent eaves to access the attic in that particular direction. The picture on the left, you'll notice how worn it is. Now you may look at that real quick and like, oh, that's nothing. No, that was actually caused by the squirrel climbing the corner of the building and taking off the stone embedded into the into the tar there. It was actually wearing it down. But again, if you're not looking carefully, would you have noticed it? Raccoons. Raccoons are like elephants walking through an attic. They will literally just stomp everything down. They are, uh, people call them in my industry, they call them trash pandas. So they are an incredible creature incredible climbing ability. And this is how an attic can look if they've been in there for a while. The, low, the upper right hand corner shows you raccoons climbing the downspout. So what, do you check the downspouts? Do you see smudges on them? Well, that's classic sign of raccoons climbing the downspouts. So will a raccoon use a tree branch to access a roof? Absolutely. But a raccoon doesn't need that. You can just climb the downspout to the roof. Not a problem. That's all those smudge marks are caused by raccoons. Here's where a raccoon just simply broke through the corner of a roof. And you would not necessarily see that unless you were climbing a ladder or getting far enough away from the house to see that hole exposed. Because again, it only takes four inches for the raccoon to squeeze in. And then the lower right hand corner, you see that little change in coloration on the ceiling? That's from a raccoon toilet that's starting to seep through the sheetrock. Birds. Birds are pretty easy because you're dealing with white droppings. White droppings are a clue for birds. They also create these kind of voluminous nests and crevice dwellers. The lower left hand picture is actually the nest of a starling. Starlings like to fill the void and so they will literally keep bringing in grass trying to fill this attic void in this building. It's amazing. That'll fill a 30 gallon trash bag. Okay so if you see that 
you know you're dealing with starlings. On the picture on the right, I want you to look at it carefully and ask yourself, can you see it? Can you see where the birds are? And I hope you can because they're going to be right up here. See the line of white? Okay. Again, bird droppings and nests, pretty straightforward. Again, you see the whitewash here, classic sign of birds. Most of us are going to be pretty familiar with that. But when you're inspecting, you want to be thinking about those gaps. Here we have a ridge vent, sometimes the end vent, the end of the ridge vent is not covered. Here we have a bunch of pipes going into an attic from probably, I think, an air conditioner system. But notice it's not sealed up. That's easy access for an animal. Here we have mushroom vents. These should never be sealed from inside the attic. They always should be sealed from the outside because if you seal them on the inside, you create a platform for an animal to build a nest. And if it's a motorized unit, then that unit will heat up and then start the nesting material on fire. This is why you always secure those vents from the exterior, not the interior of the structure. Chimneys. Well, you ask your client, are your chimneys capped? And they'll say, oh yeah, they're capped. Well, this, this flue isn't capped because they, they forgot about that one. And then this one, yeah, it has sort of a cheap cap on it, but notice how it's bent allowing an animal entry into the chimney. Now, and some of you, you don't have raccoons in your chimney in your part of the country. Don't worry, they'll figure it out eventually. But on the East Coast, the raccoons have learned how to do that. And so it's not, it's very common for raccoons to use this as a maternity nest where they'll raise young above the smoke shelf in the smoke shelf area. So people will complain of hearing chirping inside of their, inside of their fireplace. And they think it's birds, it's not birds, uh, it's gonna be, uh, raccoons, if they hear a grinding noise, that's going to be chimney swifts, and uh, that's much different than the chirping of raccoons. How about the other types of chimneys when you're dealing with the double wall chimneys that are steel? These can often be receptacles for birds because birds will come up here, notice how this is not screened properly, stand on this edge trying to get warm, get the heat from this particular uh, vent, and sometimes they'll fall into these gaps, and then over time they will actually pile up interfering with the insulation factor of this particular product. So sometimes clients will complain of noises in their chimney and when you open up the damper, I would do that very, very carefully, um, and there's nothing there. It's because the animal's actually trapped in between the two, the two pipes. Uh, I think that more modern uh, chimneys now don't have these types of gaps and so I think that problem is going to become less of a concern over time, thank goodness, because it's really quite a mess. All right, I've been covering a lot of material, so let's slow down here a little bit. I've kind of hit you with a lot. Let's talk about identifying SCAT. My goal here is not to make you a SCAT identification expert, but I want you to think differently about SCAT. Most people, when they talk about SCAT, the first thing out of their mouth is they talk about color. Let me be kind of blunt here. Color really doesn't matter that much. If you don't believe me, eat spinach for a week and tell me what the difference is. Okay, color doesn't matter. Okay, color is really irrelevant. What we're looking for is the width of the scat and the length of the scat. And the width actually is more important. And I want to ask you a question, can you think of why? I'll let you ponder that. Okay, so when we're looking at scat, we want to think about structure, the structure of the scat. So whenever you see a pellet like this, you want to think rodent. All rodents have this similar type of structure, whether it's a mouse all the way up to a prairie dog or even a beaver. They're all that kind of same pelletized shape. If you're dealing with a tube with some slight indentations, you're dealing with a carnivore. If you have a plop, we're not really quite sure what it is. There you have to identify it based on the size, how much volume do you see in the scat? And if you ever see a scat with a white cap, you're either dealing with a snake or a bird. And we already know the bird because birds, birds poop and pee at the same time. So the, that nitrous area is what creates that white cap. So whenever you see white, you only have two options. Either gonna be a snake or it's gonna be a bird. 
But everything else I want you to think about structure and the width of the scat is actually more indicative than the length because the length can vary depending on the fiber that the animal is eating at that particular time. So the next question you want to ask is the droppings piled or are they individual? So here we have examples of piled. This is a raccoon toilet as I showed you before on the left. Here we have bat droppings on the right. Notice how I have an object in the scale in the picture for scale. Now I like to use pennies because I don't have to pick them up again. Okay remember poo is bad don't touch that, all right? So we wanna be careful when you're taking photos that you're not getting too close and disturbing things. Here's some examples of raccoon poop. Notice the inclusions in the raccoon scat. One of the ways you can tell the difference between wild animals and domestic animals is domestic animals are typically fed manufactured food, which is finely ground. So you won't see any inclusions. You won't see seeds, you won't see bones, you won't see hair in that scat necessarily the way you will in other types of animals. Notice the raccoon here, he's been eating some berries and he has all these seeds in his scat. So raccoon scat looks like uh, a large, something like a large Tootsie Roll in a sense. It's they're kind of thick, there's little cuts through them and they tend to pile them in areas like roofs, inside attics, they kind of mark their territory that way. Shrews. You might have encountered shrews in someone's house. Have you ever had a situation saying, you know, I have mouse traps and I keep catching mice, but something's eating them. Well, that's usually a shrew. And shrew droppings also create piled scat, which has a very rank odor. What you're looking for in a shrew scat is that they have a corkscrew look to them and they tend to be piled sometimes congealed and they have a rank odor. Shrews are not a huge problem in structures other than sometimes they're able to get in because they're actually killing stuff that the homeowner doesn't want in the house but most people don't want shrew toilets in their particular house but if you see that you're dealing with shrews. Insects, how do you identify insect droppings? Well insect droppings will often have a lot more grooves in it and have much weirder shapes than the shapes I've already showed you here. This one looks like a little, you know, like the pineapple grenade from the United States, where all these different grooves on it because of the way they defecate. They also tend to be significantly smaller than what we're going to be seeing in the vertebrate scats that we have here. Remember I told you earlier about how the difference between the way squirrels will chew a nut versus how a mouse will chew a nut? Here's a picture illustrating that. Notice how the mouse has gnawed from the end to try to access the kernel inside the nut. A squirrel wouldn't do all, spend all that time. A squirrel just cuts it in half. Okay, just vices right through it. Here's an example of a mouse dropping. Notice how small it is. You're looking at something like a rice seed compared to other types of things. Now, how do we distinguish between a mouse dropping and a bat dropping? Well, here it is. You don't have to be an expert to do this. This is something I teach to people all the time because this is exactly what I would use to determine whether it's a mouse dropping or a bat dropping. Are the droppings scattered? Are they intermittent? Are they hard when they're dry? Remember, you're not touching it with your bare hands, right? You're going to use an object to touch that. And is it smooth? Bat droppings are rough. If you look carefully at this photo, they're not smooth, they're rough. They're dropped repeatedly. They tend to be piled in quarters. But when they're dry, if you take a little stick and just tap one of them, it'll crumble. And you'll see little specks of uh, what I call fairy dust inside of the dropping it, because those are the exoskeletons of the insects that the bats have been eating. The mice won't have that. Here's an example of bird droppings, pretty straightforward, very easy for most people. Here's an example of chimney swift droppings. Notice all the feathers. And this has been accumulating, this was in a school, this has been accumulating for years. Chimney swifts are a protected species, so you can't just simply cap the chimney until they leave. So the chimney must only be capped after they've migrated out, which typically would occur late August or the fall. Never close in a hole unless you're absolutely swear to God certain it's no longer being used. Remember the story I told you about the carpenter covering it over with the plywood. I've covered a ton of information here today. I want to thank you all for your patience. Um, my bottom line is just remember, protect yourself with your PPE. Make sure you're wearing your properly fitted respirator. Think about some of the diseases you might be exposing yourself to. That's why you're wearing your PPE to protect yourself. 
and then think about what you're seeing to make sure you're informing your client of particular wildlife issues that he or she may have on that particular property so that you could know yourself but also to inform your client of potential problems that could occur and maybe you want to refer to a qualified wildlife control professional. Wonderful Stephen, thank you very much. I'm looking at some questions and uh, we only have one. Uh, it was from John a little while back when we were talking about protecting yourself. He mm. said, how do, you, how do you do a fit test or where do you get one done? Okay, fit tests would typically be done. I would call, I've, I've been telling people to call their local fire department and say, hey, where do you get your fit testing done? So fit testing can be done in two different ways. There's a qualitative test and then there's called a, um, a quantitative test. Quantitative tests are where they put, hook you up to a computer to see if, if everything's fitting properly. A qualitative test is there you're using certain odors and to see if you smell it. If you smell the odor, then you know that the fit is wrong. <laughs> so uh, you have two different ways of doing it, but I would call, you could call your health department or call your local fire department.